Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Adam Kahane about leading as facilitating, that leadership is not telling staff what to do, but enabling people to work together. Adam Kahane, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you, Jonathan. It is a pleasure to be with you today. You're joining us from the UK. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about the the, the topic around your recent book, Leading as Facilitating, that leadership is not telling staff what to do, but enabling people to work together more effectively and collaboratively. So I think that will be a really fun conversation. Before we get started, I just wanted to share Adam's bio with everybody. Adam Kahane is director of Rios Partners, an international social enterprise that helps people move forward together on their most important and intractable issues. Adam is a leading organizer, designer, and facilitator of processes through which businesses, government, and civil society leaders can work together to change address such challenges. He has worked in more than 50 countries in every part of the world with executives and politicians, generals and guerrillas, civil servants and trade unionists, communist activists and United Nations officials, clergy and artists. That's quite the list. Uh, You've done it all. It's a pleasure to have you with me today to have this nice conversation. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background, um, personal context before we dive on in? No, I think you said uh, communist activists. I have worked with communist activists, but I, uh, but I think that was supposed to say community activists. So I, work, <laughs> I would say more often with community activists in general than uh, specifically that's so f- with communist activists. But anyway. Um, yes, that is no. so funny that that's what my mind read on the page. Um, that's yeah, that's great. Uh, co- community activists and communist activists. That's fantastic. Yes. Um, the, 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 yeah. the point is you've done a lot with a lot of different types of people and stakeholders yeah. and leaders. And I think that's, that's really important. Yeah, thanks. So yes, that's been uh, what I've done and what my colleagues and I do all day, every day for the past 30 years. And yeah, this whole um, area of how can we work together uh, with diverse others uh, inside our organization, outside our organization, including people we don't agree with or like or trust. This has been the center of uh, of my work uh, yeah. uh, over the last 30 years. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So as we get started, uh, you, you've written many books, uh, lots of great topics we could discuss. I thought we would just focus on your recent book, uh, Leading as Facilitating. Um, and, and maybe you can start off by just framing up for us um, the general premise behind the book and why this book, why now, why is it so important? Okay, so I have written five books, but they all say the same thing. So uh, it's not <laughs> as impressive as it sounds. Uh, I'm a man who's only had one idea, uh, although I think it's a good idea. And the one idea is that, or I think it's an important idea. Uh, and that one idea is that um, in order to deal with the challenges we face, we increasingly need to, to collaborate with diverse others. Um, yeah, whether that's inside organizations or on community or national or global issues, that's uh, that's what I've seen. And the books have been trying to develop the practice and theory uh, for that work. The, um, the most recent book... Uh, which you referred to, 
includes this idea that I'm looking forward to talking about with you, which is how is what would a leadership as facilitation look like? The actual title of the book is different. The, the, the book is actually called Facilitating Breakthrough, How to Remove Obstacles, Bridge Differences, and Move Forward Together. So it focuses on this idea of facilitation, but I'm redefining facilitation not as a uh, some particular profession, but as the activity of uh, helping people work together to affect change with that, that role uh, being played by uh, leaders and managers and uh, consultants and team members and coaches. Uh, and, and the argument, which I think uh, is something that's worth, that I'd like to talk about with you because you have a, a broader a broader view of the leadership and an organizational world than I do is uh, to what extent is that moving from being a peripheral leadership skill to being a core leadership skill. And um, I guess the only thing I'd say by way of setting that up or making the bridge between the previous four books and this fifth one is that um, is the following idea that there's more than one way to try to change things in the world uh, and there isn't one right way. Uh, I, my idea is that there's four basic ways of dealing with things not being the way you think they ought to be. You could try to force them to be the way you think they ought to be. Uh, and whether as an executive or a, or a, a, an activist uh, or a, a government official or a, or a military dictator. So that has a role. Uh, the obvious difficulty with that is you try to force people to do things they don't want to do, they'll push back and uh, it may not work for very well or for very long. The second way is adapting. I don't like the way things are, but I can't make them the way I want them to be. I don't have the will or, or power to do that. And so I try to live with it as best I can. And people do that about lots of things every day. It's not unusual. The third way is exiting. I don't like the way things are. I'm not willing to live with them the way they are. And so I, I quit, whether that's quitting my job uh, or getting a divorce or emigrating, that's exiting. And in that context, collaboration is the fourth option. It's I don't like things the way they are. I don't think I can force them to be the way, way I want them to be. I don't think I can um, live, uh, live with them as they are. I can't exit. And therefore, let me, let me try to work with others, including others who I may not agree with or like or trust in order to change the situation. And then the final piece of this, if I'm arguing that the role of collaboration is growing, the world needs more and better collaboration. And I'm defining facilitating as helping people collaborate. And therefore, the world needs more and better facilitation. So that's sort of how yeah. I get. Now, I've saved you from reading four <laughs> previous books. I, that's a, and probably like probably $30 in, in, uh, in Amazon <laughs> charges. So there you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, that's that's fantastic. And, and I agree from an organizational and leadership perspective. That's how I think of facilitation as well. Um, and I think it's incredibly important. Uh, you, you alluded to the complex nature of societal challenges, you know, the most perplexing and, and pervasive and, and persistent challenges that we face. There, there's a reason why they, they um, are, are so challenging. And it's because uh, they're complex, they're messy, they're nuanced. And there, there aren't easy answers, right? There, if there was an easy answer, it would be solved and we would move on to the next thing. Um, and yet that doesn't happen. So we need to take systems approaches, holistic approaches um, to try to uh, drive meaningful change. And that can only happen as you bring together diverse stakeholders and perspectives to talk through the issues at hand, right? Even when you may not trust them, even when you may be ideologically ideologically, you know, completely 
opposed to them. Uh, you know, no. all, you still have to be willing and able to reach across the aisle to to have that dialogue and to you know facilitate those types of conversations if we have any hope of of really driving meaningful systemic change. Um, and in my mind, you know, as I was as we were preparing for this uh, episode today, and I was thinking about this whole idea about um, leadership and facilitation and um, the importance of that. I think of just the nature of the world today, um, the polit- uh, the polarization uh, in politics, for example, in the U.S., um, now, it's not just in the U.S. that we have this issue, but it's certainly pervasive in the U.S. Um, and how, how can we have like even a reasonable conversation over really important issues and that ability for the average person to have a good conversation with something, someone who completely disagrees agrees with them? It's, it, it seems like that's just taken a nosedive in recent years. Yeah. Um, and so whether we're talking about society at large, we're talking within organizations when there's divisions and perspectives and, and attitudes around policies, practices, procedures, whatever the case may be. Uh, I, I, I'm not so sure we've gotten any better at how we do this. And I think we've actually gotten quite a bit worse at how we do this. And so uh, more important than ever in my mind is the ability of good leadership to play that role, to be peacekeepers, to bring people together, to facilitate conversations, to empower people, um, to bring their perspectives to the table, to feel psychologically safe to do so, yeah. et cetera. And, and if leaders don't do that, uh, th- then the, 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 the problem just gets perpetuated and in, in many cases gets deepened. And then it's yeah. going to be even harder to overcome. Yeah. So I, I think you're, you've raised a crucial aspect of the story, which is it's not just that issues of economics or healthcare or education or um, economic development or climate change are complex and difficult. In addition to that, uh, um, uh, the polar or the, the differences among stakeholders uh, are becoming more severe. Now, you could say that that's partly as a result of a positive development, which is more people have voice and the ability to make what they care about heard, and people are less willing to just go along with things than they might have been. And in addition to that, we're seeing uh, increasing fragmentation and polarization, bubbles, and worse than that, uh, demonization. It's not just that uh, I see you things different. I see that you see things differently than me. It's that you're wrong. It's actually not just that you're wrong. It's that you're bad. It's not just that you're bad. You're actually the devil. And how yeah, could you're, I you're evil? With the devil. <laughs> you're evil. So I call that demonization uh, or enemyifying the the ability or the tendency to to take ordinary differences and make them matters of life and death. Somebody pointed out to me last week that the kind of reactivity that we saw on social media, we now see in real life meetings, people just immediately giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down uh, uh, in real life. So, so yes, I do see the a role of leaders as if we're going to, if you're going to, lead more than yourself by definition you have to bring people together and be and less and less can that be done by just telling people what to do and therefore the idea of the leader as facilitator is crucial now i should say one thing that maybe will help people understand where i'm coming from that um my my evening job is uh writing because i like reflecting and trying to understand you know, how does this stuff work? But my day job is actually facilitating such groups uh, on complex issues. And, you know, I did it in for the first time 30 years ago in South Africa between uh, 
white and black uh, opposition and establishment, communist and capitalist uh, uh, politicians, business people, trade unionists, uh, uh, um, community people, um, and in Colombia during the Civil War and uh, on climate change issues globally and with indigenous and uh, settler communities uh, in North America. So <laughs> when I say it can be done, I, it's not, I'm not um, offering a, a theory. I'm describing my experience of hundreds of such uh, processes that bring together actors uh, who agree on some things and disagree on other things and trust each other on some stuff and don't trust each other on, on other stuff, but who whether they like it or not, or even if they don't like it, are faced with a situation that none of them can resolve alone, and therefore they need to at least try to resolve it alone. And, my, and so when I talk about a practice and theory of facilitation, of how do you facilitate breakthrough, this is not a, just a conceptual exercise. This is based on, you know... <laughs> Uh, a lot of trial and error. Yeah, thank you for that. And certainly, you're, you're pointing out, you know, some of the the really challenging places around the world uh, where we've needed um, this type of facilitation, peacekeeping, and peacemaking, and and dialogue and such. Um, and that's of course super important at a societal level. But let's not forget that these same processes happen within organizations every day, right? You have political camps within organizations. Um, you, you have power dynamics and, and political games that happen <laughs> within organizations. Like these sort, same sorts of things happen within any organization, you know, each and every day. It's just the nature of getting people together, you know, and interacting with each other as these types of things emerge. So as we think about, you know, facilitating um, leadership within an organizational setting. Say I'm an executive or a senior level manager. I have teams of people that report to me or other managers even that report to me. How, how do I start the process of shifting my thinking? Um, say I, I, you know, naturally think more in terms of a command control, autocratic leadership kind of a style, yet I recognize that that does, isn't going to serve me well today. It's not going to serve my teams well. How do I start to make the shift um, towards more facilitative, empowering type of a leader? Uh, and what are some of the specific things I could start doing and in, in enacting within my teams so that we can bridge divides and, and start to you know, leverage the diversity uh, that we have within the organization? You know, well, I think it's a crucial question because in in many, if not most, organizations uh, and organizational cultures, the default mode is well, command and control is uh, has a pejorative connotation, but the default mode is hierarchical, and you know, if that's working for you, God bless. Uh, but my observation is it works less and less of the time for the two reasons we've been discussing, because the situations require more people to be involved and because more people insist on being involved, uh, whether they're employees or community members or, or, um, or politicians. Uh, or, or environmentalists. And so I think the first bridge to be crossed is to recognize that the default uh, doesn't work or works much less often than it used to. That That's um, and so you can keep pushing the default button, but you're going to get less and less good results. I guess if I had to, if I had to um, emphasize one thing, which I think is the most important, is the most important thing, and is simple but not easy, I would say 
uh, work on listening. Uh, because most of the time, for many of us, including me, I'm not really listening. I'm waiting for your mouth to stop moving so that I can go back to telling you the truth about the way things are. And I'm not even really aware that there's any truth outside my thinking about how things are. And so that shift from what Otto Sharma calls downloading to debating, where I recognize that there's different ways of looking at this, and we're going to decide which of us is right and which of us is wrong, uh, to dialoguing, which is where we're going to um, try to see this through the, see what is unfolding through the perspectives of different ones of us, to what he calls presencing, being fully present to the situation as it is arising. Anyhow, this is a complicated way of saying that the single biggest leverage uh, is to shift out of downloading. And uh, years ago, I had a colleague who said, if you want a simple way to remember this, just put, when you find yourself pounding the table, just put at the front of your sentence, in my opinion, just a little reminder to me and to you that like, I do have a point of view about this, but it's in my opinion. And if that doesn't work, try in my humble opinion. And that just, but that it's a, it's a joke in a way, but in a way, but also that actually takes you out of downloading. It reminds you that, yes, I do have a, a way of thinking about what is happening or should happen or what we ought to do about it, but it's a perspective. Now let's, and that's the beginning of, of, of uh, facilitating breakthrough. Yeah, I like that. And, and the listening is always the, the starting point, I think. And if you're not actively listening, um, like you're describing, then people don't feel valued. They don't feel that you trust them. They don't feel seen and heard. Uh, they don't feel understood. And that has to be the foundation upon which we build compromise and, you know, move, move things in a collaborative direction. And the, the greater the distrust between parties, the more that's important, right? And to build trust, I mean, there's so much we could talk about in terms of building trust through this facilitative process. Um, but, you know, I, I was sitting in a, in a class, I was in a graduate course years ago, a couple decades ago. Um, and they had a, a senior negotiator. He was a, a union uh, negotiator who came into the class. It was an, uh, an executive HR, you know, course. And he was talking about how to be a successful negotiator. And, you know, a lot of his advice was counterintuitive. And much of it was centered around what you've just been talking about you know, with me these past, you know, 20 plus minutes. And he said, first and foremost, I, I have established a reputation as someone who's a straight shooter, who what I say is, um, I, I'm not going to lie. I have integrity. What I say is truth, and um, I'm going to put my best foot forward. I'm going to listen. I'm I'm going to you know try to find win win solutions. You know, so on and so forth. So he's describing all of this, and this is juxtaposition to other people you know who talk about you know power plays and negotiating and in those types of environments and such, and it, it was just eye-opening to me. And it, it, it has stuck with me ever since that mm. if you want like good, sustainable results, then you have to build it on foundations of trust that is built upon, you know, uh, mutual accountability and listening uh, and understanding. And that's what this, this gentleman conveyed to the class these many decades ago. And um, that's what I, I haven't seen sometimes when I see other people take different types of approaches, they might have short-term wins, uh, but the long-term sustainability of what they're trying to accomplish is usually undermined by the tactics that they take to get those short-term wins. And so let's let's be more long-term and strategic about how we're approaching facilitation within our organizations and within our teams. And you may only be in that position for a year. Uh, your team, you're going to have turnover. You may have people leave. Um, and so, you know, it's not like we're going to have the same group, core group of people together for 30 years. Um, that's not, you know, what the modern workplace looks like, like at all. But I like to have the attitude that I will act as if I'm going to work with these people for the next 30 years. 
Uh, and, and if that's my attitude, then I'm going to approach them very differently. I'm not going to manipulate. I'm not going to try to undermine. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on um, trust and relationships and making sure that, that uh, I understand where they're coming from. Right. Yeah. And that's just a very different starting place <laughs> to come to the difficult, sticky dynamics uh, than when you approach it from, you know, uh, an adversarial point of view, starting with a fixed pie mentality, and and you're going to try to figure out how much you can get away with, right? And that's yeah. unfortunately what often happens. So I, uh, years ago, uh, took a course from Roger Fisher, who's a Harvard negotiation professor, um, author of the all-time best-selling book on negotiation, Getting to Yes. And I remember Fisher saying, uh, he wasn't telling us to be trusting he was telling us to be trustworthy. Yeah, I would, I would put it another way, the same, say the same thing in another way, because I'm, I work a lot on, on, yeah, how we can resolve issues in a city or in a country. And I've played with the following. In English, the word we use or the, the most important word in peace building is the word coexistence. That's a very popular word in that field. In Spanish, they use a slightly different word. They say convivencia, which means living together. It's the same word used for a couple living together. So, so yes, how, how do we approach things, whether it's in a community or on planet Earth, uh, with the understanding that, like it or not, we're going to be living together for a long time, and how how can we make that work? So yes, I think there is very much a uh, a short term versus long term perspective, and uh, I, I yeah. don't think <laughs> bossing yeah. people about or manipulating them is not much future. No, no, it doesn't. You might get that short term win. Um, but you're, you're just undermining your abilities in the long term. Adam, this has just been a really fun conversation. We could go on and on and on. But I know at the time and I'm gonna have to let you go here in just a minute. Before we wrap up for today, though, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you find out more about your work, where they can find your books, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, well, the way to find out about the books and uh the work that I've been talking about is to look at the website of the organization I'm a director of. It's called Rios Partners, R-E-O-S partners.com, riospartners.com. Um, uh, and in, in included there, you'll also see the references to my books, including this final one uh, or this most recent one, Facilitating Breakthrough. Um, the final word, yeah, I would just want to underline what I said before. I think given the challenges we face in our organizations and in our communities and on our planet, uh, the world needs more and better collaboration and therefore more and better facilitation. And that's what I'm trying to support through this work and yeah. through this writing. Wonderful. Thank you, Adam. It has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Adam and his team can do for you. Check out the books. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.